All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're going to go ahead and do a quick round of introductions so you know who you're uh, seeing and, and speaking with today. Uh, I'll kind of kick things off for us real briefly. Um, my name is Andy Whitaker. Uh, uh, this has been Clark. I'll let Ben introduce himself directly. Uh, we're both with Rusticy Software, uh, the company that's been around for 20 years and kind of behind the scenes in a bunch of different learning systems around the world, helping to support e-learning standards in a bunch of different ways. Um, so with that, we're going to kind of dive into a conversation today about XAPI uh, and the sort of considerations that organizations and even some vendors should make when thinking about adopting it in various ways. A uh, little bit of background on me, I'm on the sales team now, but about uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, brought on to Rusticy Software as uh, an evangelist. Uh, so this was in the very earliest days of uh, what then was called the Tin Can API, now the Experience API. Uh, and my job at the time was to help uh, spread the word about uh, the Experience API to uh, our customers primarily, but then to the broader industry by speaking at conferences and uh, and those types of things. So I'll come at this conversation from more of a non-technical place. Uh, and that's uh, why we have Ben also joining the call. Uh, so Ben, why don't you say a few words about yourself? All right, um, thanks Andy. I'm uh, Ben Clark. Uh, I've been here at Rusticy Software for 12 years now. Um, I'm the uh, lead developer on the engine team, which uh, among other things, uh, implements uh, XAPI as an LRS. Um, my, I was involved in the e-learning space even before uh, I joined uh, Rusticy, did a lot with uh, SCORM, and that was really part of why I joined Rusticy. Um, then uh, even before uh, XAPI existed, um, we were looking at other, other ways to improve SCORM or what would come next after SCORM. There was this thing called uh, Let's see RTWS, which was another attempt to uh, improve SCORM, which that didn't wind up going anywhere. Um, but then before XAPI was XAPI, uh, it was Project Tin Can. Uh, and, I, uh, and we asked a lot of people what they thought uh, needed to be improved with SCORM, what they'd like to see in some successor to SCORM. And out of that came the Tin Can API, which eventually became XAPI. Um, so I will be coming at this from a much more technical background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fortunately for us, uh, we've got Ben uh, lovingly sometimes referred to as the godfather of Tin Can uh, within the within the building. I don't know how far outside of Rust that's gotten, but uh, <laughs> I like to call you that. All right. Okay, so uh, some of the things that we're going to try to cover in the amount of time that we have uh, today and hopefully leaving a little bit of time for questions at the end. Uh, we're all capable. Uh, presumably of reading words on a page. So I won't go verbatim through this list, but uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to track lots of different things with the Experience API, and there's some potential pitfalls and things to consider around that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, data interpretation and data interoperability is, is a thing that continues to be uh, an important um, uh, aspect of the spec to understand and to try to get our heads around as a as individual implementers, but also as the broader sort of community around these things. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, about that. Um, getting uh, into some of the things that are technically missing from XAPI, um, which leads us into a conversation about some XAPI profiles, uh, such as CMI5, if you've heard of that before. Um, and then if, if time permits, we'll, uh, we'd love to learn a little bit more about uh, some, some of the projects that you all have been working on. Uh, and, you know, along with along those lines, uh, you know, any questions that you might have uh, that we could be uh, helpful with uh, providing some some answers around. So we'll kind of dive right into the tracking side of things. Um, I think this is pers from a personal perspective. This is one of the more exciting aspects of the experience API, but also uh, one of the more daunting parts of the spec and uh, thinking about how to implement the specification. We have a couple simple examples on this slide that you can see uh, that sort of come from a couple different um, uh, ideas about where to start when tracking experiences and activities using XAPI. So Andy answered a question 
seems like an important thing to track. And if you're interested in understanding how people are answering questions in an assessment, for example, that sounds like a great thing to start with uh, or consider tracking as far as an implementation is concerned. Uh, ben, click the link. You know, that starts to get into this space of, are we tracking more than we maybe need to? Um, it really just depends on, do you really want to understand why Ben clicked on that link or what that link was and various things like that? So we're kind of coming at this from a couple different angles. You know, my background is in, uh, with respect to the spec, is helping folks kind of think through some of the initial ideas around implementing it, leveraging it, um, how far to take it. Um, and I've seen organizations go in a couple different paths. And so from a non-technical perspective, I'm going to talk about uh, the ideas around what to track, how much to track. So there is one camp, I would say, uh, and I, I kind of live in both, uh, candidly, that is um, come with a plan before implementing it. Um, you'll hear us at Rustacy talk about this in certain ways. Uh, one of those is to start with the end in mind, um, understand the questions that you're seeking answers to, and have that guide your implementation of the Experience API within whatever it is you're interested in tracking, e-learning content, an application, whatever it might be. And that's nice for providing some, some guardrails uh, around uh, tracking uh, just the right information that you need to answer those questions. Um, another camp is to say something to the effect of, we don't know what questions we want to answer. And so maybe we should throw everything into a learning record store and track, track everything. And I've had some organizations that I've worked with over the years that have taken that approach um, and have made sound arguments for why, or what they believe to be sound arguments for why they might go track more than what they might need because they're afraid that when they get to the point where they want to start answering questions, they don't have the data necessary to answer those questions. Um, so it's, you know, from my perspective, I'm, I sort of straddle the fence a little bit. I can see the arguments for both sides from a non-technical perspective. I think it's interesting, Ben, you know, we were having this debate yesterday in preparation for, for this presentation. Um, I, I think it would be useful for you to kind of go into maybe some of the technical implications of either side. Maybe, you know, I know yesterday we were talking a little bit more about just track everything and what are the pitfalls of that. So what, what are some of your thoughts on the on the tracking more or less argument? Sure. Um, I, I don't think it's only a question of tracking more or less for one thing, because even yeah. when you're tracking a lot, I think you can't get away. Well, it's difficult to get away from starting out with where do you want to end up? Um, because you might think you're tracking everything. And even if you're tracking a lot, you might find that you're not tracking exactly what, what it is that you wind up needing later on. Like saying, okay, Ben answered a question. Obviously you, you, you want to, uh, it seems obvious how to track that, but then, um, you, you know, we, we might want the answer to the question. Um, are you tracking the question that was actually answered with that? Hopefully. Um, are you tracking just a reference to what that question was? Are you tracking the actual text of that question? Um, are you tracking with it, you know, all the possible correct answers or could those have changed? Um, and uh, then uh, are, are you tracking how long it took to answer the question? Mm -hmm. Can you even capture that? Um, so, and then with clicking a link too, you know, do, do you want to capture mouse movements on the way to clicking the link? You might think you're capturing everything, but, but you might not be. Right. Um, and then from a technical point of view, we do get into the situation where there are limits to processing capacity of, uh, or you have to keep spending more money to get more capacity to churn through a lot of statements. When it turns out that you've got too many things, there winds up being a cost to that. Right. You're thinking about the LRS side of things in that. Yeah. Statement, right. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, personally, I think it is a, it, it's an interesting approach to, to provide some guardrails around what, you, what it is you're, you're, you're ultimately track within the activity or experiences you're interested in reporting on later. And uh, although I could, I can, I can see arguments for the track everything and worry about it later, I think there is some real value to, uh, 
trying to state those questions ahead of time uh, and implement the experience API in such a way that allows you to answer those questions that you can identify ahead of time. Um, and, and, and for it, the it record, solves solve some problems. Yeah, go ahead. It, it, if I may jump in, I also yeah. see the value in tracking more than you think you might need. You <laughs> can ignore statements, you know, if, if you yeah, think, yeah, there's a chance that you might need it, you, you can track it. And even though there are, you do eventually hit capacity limits, that those keep growing. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I don't know that we'll, I don't know that we'll have a firm, a firm sound argument one way or the other on this one. So uh, maybe use your best judgment uh, on, on what you think makes the most sense for, uh, for what you're, you're planning to do. Um, okay, so, you know, uh, going beyond what to track, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to think about the interpretation of the data side of things. Uh, and whenever you talk to folks at Rust to see, you sort of get this, uh, this fired, fired, fired scenario that we've talked about almost from the, the very beginning, uh, where, you know, in one place, you know, Chris fired Andy. In another example, Chris fired a kiln in a pottery class. And then in the third example, Chris fired a cannon uh, and released the Kraken. So, uh, you know, we're, we're using the same verb uh, to describe very different activities. Um, and this starts to get us into selecting um, IDs within statements um, from uh, from resources that currently exist. This is an area where, you know, as, as Ben and I were chatting yesterday about things, we start to venture into the space of uh, making recommendations around using pre-existing IDs for various elements of this the statements that that your system wants to generate. Um, ben, what are your, what are some of your, th your thoughts around kind of? I know we talked about registries a little bit yesterday. Um, would love to kind of get your take on how you would consult somebody or recommend to somebody to not try to limit the interpretation issues that might come up with with the spec. Sure. So I think it's important to uh, to keep in mind here when we're looking at at these human readable verbs what what you're actually winding up with on, and actually not even just for the verbs but for the right. um, you know the kiln here will not be the word kiln it will be right. an idea as well but the verbs will be a URI which serves as an identifier um, you know to a, to a computer these will all be very clearly different and um, Andy you mentioned uh, registries or um, profiles mm -hmm. um, I I know ADL is uh, is doing some work on uh, on profiles and I believe um, one of my colleagues is going to put in the chat uh, a reference to uh, to that um as well as uh an example of what's what some of these ids look like um so uh, i definitely think it makes sense to look to if there are profiles already available that meet your needs the very best is if there's a full you know people put a lot of thought into these profiles so the, if there's a profile that's been talked to death and everyone knows exactly what each of the things in it means that's great that's the best but if if there are ids out there that have been that have seen usage, especially that people have been used to have a particular meaning, then you're better off going and using that ID rather than coming up with your own, because the, all, the whole point is to be understood. So if you use uh, an ID that someone has used before, or even better, that's in a profile, it will help um, anyone who is interpreting these statements, or even more so a, a system that's trying to interpret the statements in an automated manner it'll right. help um, understand what that actually meant. Yeah, yeah. And we were we were talking yesterday, you know, we, in the early days at Rust to C Software, we created the, the tin can registry. Um, XAPI registry is probably what we refer to it these days. Um, and then there's also a registry that that ADL has has deployed and, and, and manages to a certain degree as well. Um, you know, uh, I think where we settled on this um, in prior conversations is that I don't know that we are predisposed to use either or, um, you know, if there's a if there's a pre-existing verb ID that's on the registry through xapi.com, use that. Uh, if you find a different one or a better one, or there's a different thing that you're wanting to track and there's a specific ID out on the ADL registry, use that. Um, Err away from uh, or hesitate to start creating your own yeah. uh, when it's not necessary. 
Um, right. You know, if you're in a specific community of practice, sometimes that uh, kind of forces you down that path, perhaps. But existing existing uh, uh, IDs, existing uh, information to construct your statements from, I think is is what we're really proposing here. And again, like to just echo what Ben said, uh, man, if there's an existing profile that is just super solid and you and you see it being used, um, that's the gold. That's the gold I think uh, to to really strive for. And I want to jump back on what you said about not using it if it's the wrong one. Yeah, we you should be a bit hesitant to come up with new IDs, but not so hesitant that you take anything even close to one of these examples. You know, That's where you point. want to say fired in a kiln, and you use the fired out of a cannon because it sounds similar. If right. they're different, they're different. So don't try to force it, please. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, you know, we talked about uh, kind of, well, we haven't really talked about it here, but in the in the early days of the Experience API specification uh, that we were working on back in 2010, 2011, releasing kind of in 2012 with the, the ADL team, um, there was uh, uh, an, uh, some, some messaging, I think, Ben, that you were hearing from the community about um, presenting some option of packaging content in the in the early days. Um, and so what we're trying to represent with this particular slide is that technically there are things like what you're seeing in this list missing from the actual specification um, that have later been uh, addressed with the profile of CMI5 primarily. Um, and so, you know, uh, just kind of stating if you're looking at packaging, launch mechanisms, defining information model, tracking in an LMS, um, there are kind of some legacy ways that we've handled that in the past, but kind of CMI5 taking over that role uh, in, in, in this space. We'll talk a little bit more about CMI5 here in a bit, but um, anything, Ben, that you would comment on this particular slide? Yeah, so uh, at XAPI, you know, we set out and, and even back um, yeah, back in the beginning, I, I would say we were looking for just people want to be able to track anything they want to be able to track. And we were very focused on how to get that information from the learning experience to the system where it was going to be tracked. Now the mm -hmm. LRS. Um, and we, we just simply were not uh, we or anyone working on X API. We're not really focused on the goals of, well, how do you create package some learning content, which mm -hmm most people still need to do. We, we, we were looking at all these other sort of experiences and wanting to make sure there was a way to track them. Like if you're doing a simulation, you're not necessarily going to have a package for that. We right. wanted to, to enable those other use cases. Or I, I, what, we have another slide. We have the idea of if you have a, a CPR dummy and you want to track some things from that. Well, right. packaging just doesn't apply. So in trying to enable these more uh, out of the box uh, use cases, uh, th there was this focus just on what, what's known as transport, just getting the information from one system to the other, not, not these other concerns. Right. But it turns out a lot of people still want to be able to do these things. They've got, they need to have some artifact that they take from one system to the other. So, hey, you know, now you can actually go use this. They need to provide some way for the LMS to say, okay, we actually have the learner who's supposed to be using this we need to actually bring it up on their screen and have it associated with that learner and the, and the registration for that learner, presumably. We need to actually know what you mean when you say this thing is completed. Mm -hmm. What is it that's completed? Is, right. it, is it this overall package? What package? Uh, you know, okay, I completed some activity, but is that activity the course or is some other activity the course? So the, the, these are some, uh, some limitations that wind up being addressed by CMI5. Yeah, yeah. So we'll come back around to CMI5 here in just a bit. But, um, you know, there was attempts to sort of to sort of handle these things in the early days, but never really officially became a part of the actual specification that's that's in, in use today. Um, OK, so moving on to uh, did I get that right? Oh, yeah. Adding profile. OK, so yeah. So this actually transitions us into kind of that that profile conversation. Um, yeah. I'm not going to attempt to sort of explain a profile. I think that's uh, that I'll, I'll let Ben kind of step in here and just kind of at least give kind of a, a an overview of 
what it is, what what it's intended to help with, and then we can talk about a couple that we we that get heavy usage today and and will gain in usage in the future. And then we had a couple ideas of some other things and just generally about where profiles might go. But Ben, any any kind of overview that you want to provide on? Sure. So. Profiles? Um, a profile itself, it's, it's a way of understanding and being understood when you're talking XAPI. So XAPI, you know, it's this series of statements about anything you want to make statements about, you're using any IDs you want, but a profile is giving you some rails back. Um, it is giving you the, uh, the ability to know, okay, if if it's covered by the profile, because not every profile is going to cover everything. Mm -hmm. If, um, for example, the the video profile will give you an understood way to say if um, if the if the learner or you know whoever's watching a video, if they've moved the slider and they've seeked to another spot in the video, and you want to express that, here is how you do that. Mm -hmm. So then, when you turn around and someone is using the video profile and you see the statement from you, you can go, okay, that's the video profile. It's got an ID on it, which tells me it's the video profile. And because I know about the video profile, I can see from that ID that it is the video profile. I can interpret exactly what this means because they're following that profile. Right. So it's um, XAPI made things wide open. You can do whatever you want. It turns out that when you can do whatever you want, <laughs> it's hard to be understood. So right. the profiles, they're narrowing it back down. They're saying, well, this is a solution for this specific thing that the profile covers, and it's how you can be understood. Yeah, and when you say how how it can be understood, that's that's on the the ultimately it it it, it lays with the the learning record store that's receiving the data for that activity. Is that fair to say? Like an LRS would see statements coming in with a particular profile ID, and because it's you know machines understanding what these things mean, not human readable text. It's really the 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 LRS that's kind of benefiting from that, and well, you ultimately I, as a user of, um, or reader of the LRS. I, I'd say it. I'd actually say it's the uh, the analytics platform that the LRS. Yes, um, you yes, know, yes, To yes, be yes. very technically, you know, the yes. LRS is just it just stores the statements. Right, right, it, right. it doesn't need to care. Um, you might, you know, with CMI five, uh, for example, there is uh, some additional validation. So you might having the LRS actually reject statements as right. a result of the uh, the profile involved. Um, but it its job still isn't really to understand the statements. Yes. Um, yeah, Ben is being Ben is being uh, uh, perfectly pedantic in this way because as a non technical person. Uh, and for a lot of you that go out and sort of look at technologies that refer to themselves as learning record stores, uh, like a sister company of ours, Watershed, there's Learning Locker, there's Veracity, and yet uh, a lot of them refer to themselves as LRSs. But the point I think, you know, Ben is rightfully making is that they're more than an LRS, yeah. uh, right? They're, they're, they're beyond just storage and data transfer. They are interpretation of the data. Um, which I think is where ultimately the profile starts to bring value to the right. interpreter of the data rather than the repository of the data, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and and it can even, you probably don't want it to be a human too, but it also gives, like, if you get down to the point where a human is looking at the statements, they can be sure, you know, what what that meaning was by by uh, consulting the profile as well. But but definitely the goal is to make it machine parsable anyway, and, a, you know, something you can generate uh, reports off of. Right, right. So yeah, examples of that CMI5 is a pretty substantial profile that um, uh, the industry is is in kind of the early days of adopt of adopting. Um, just to kind of, you know, comment a little bit on that conversations that I'm having with folks on a pretty regular basis who are in the content creation space, they're authoring content, they're building content using tools, storyline, captivate, whatever your tool of choice might be. Um, that's an area where we're hoping and, and we are seeing uh, adoption uh, of CMI5 within the authoring tool space, um, which tends to be and really was with the XAPI sort of packaging stuff that Ben helped with in the early days. That's where we saw most adoption of that initially, and then it starts to bleed over into the LMS space eventually. So content tends to be a precursor for system adoption uh, in the space, at least from, from what I've seen personally. Um, so I think one of the things that we're excited about is seeing more and more authoring tools support it. 
um, having more organizations wanting to take advantage of the CMI5 support that content creation tools provide, and then also looking to procure learning systems that can be the delivery of that content, also supporting CMI5. As a, as a software provider, Rustacy Software is in kind of an interesting place to help seed the market a little bit when it comes to some of these standards. And CMI5 is one of the things that our products support already and our learning system customers can take advantage of. So we're hoping that that will you know, continue to spread and become more widely adopted across the board. Um, you know, Ben commented on the video profile. We see that as, as really the, the non-CMI5 profile that's getting the most adoption or, or utilization um, I know on the on the registry that that uh, Terrace uh, included in the chat, there are a handful of other profiles that are in that uh, that registry or tincanapi.com. Really, it could be registry.xapi.com too, probably. Uh, that is an interesting place to go if you're looking for an existing profile on assessments and some other some other things. So there are some existing profiles that that live out in the world. Um, I think from an ideas perspective, you know, when you start looking at systems uh, like a step tracker and, you know, the two ideas that we have here, CMR or CPR dummy, uh, in my mind, they're about um, kind of predetermined, a predetermined set of activities that can be sort of, that a profile can be kind of easily built around. But the other part of that, especially when it comes maybe to the step tracker, um, is the data operability interoperability side of the profile as well. Having a profile uh, help with with um, you know what statements are generated for a particular activity means that you know any application that is consuming that data could also understand what that profile means and what the data underneath that profile also means. Any thoughts there, Ben, before we move on to the next? Yeah, I'm going to touch back on the uh, CPR dummy there for for a bit because I think there's also a really great interoperability story with that idea in that yeah. if you, you know, you have a CPR dummy that can keep track of, uh, you know, has sensors so it can actually keep track of how, how it's being used. If you have that, which I understand some do, it could potentially be making statements and there'd be multiple audiences potentially for those statements. You could both have the manufacturer of the CPR dummy need to understand what was being reported. Mm -hmm. There's um, the actual training center where people are going and uh, having training on it might need to understand them. But then also um, you might see that the hospitals or other health organizations would send people to go and take training with CPR dummies might want to try to understand how they were using those dummies when they're looking at the outcomes down the road, the health outcomes mm -hmm. associated with the people who are doing, you know, that the, the work on the dummy, the, the training on the dummy, and then have to actually do CPR in real life. Right. They might be able to make some sort of correlation there. Um, so it, it's a case again, where multiple different people or organizations might want to look at that data. So it could be important to have an interoperability. Yeah. I want to touch back on CMI five also for a moment. Yeah. And, uh, specifically, oh, we're going to go to it next. That's so, right. Really? Yeah. We're ready. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and actually, it's still API, X API. And I'd like you to uh, actually just go back to the other slide just for one moment. And, and yep. oh, no, ah, wrong way, wrong way. The I other got backwards. It. I got it. If I got you it. look at even the logo for CMI5, we wanted to show you in the logo that it's CMI5 on top of X API. It's really, right. it's, uh, and, and this is a, I think, a good visual way to think about profiles that it's this other piece of the puzzle on top of X API. Anyway, yeah, great point. Now we could go forward again. Yeah, yep. so it is still X API. You're making X API statements. They're going into an X API uh, LRS. Um, again, and I've been coming back to this point, but it, it's so important. X API threw things wide open. It took away all the rails. People said they want to be able to store any sort of data, and they can. But now we need to understand it. And um, in one of the things. Uh, uh, or uh, four of the things that people really want to be able to understand for more traditional e-learning content is, was it completed? Mm -hmm. did, did the learner pass? How long did they take? And what score did they get? You know, what, what we call the big four. Right. And um, so in addition to um, 
some some uh, interactions, which you can do with XAPI anyway, and when did you launch, some things like that. Really, CMI5, um, I think the important thing to know about it is it gets you back that big four. We, okay, it gets you back understanding of that big four, because of course you can express that big four just with just plain XAPI, but right. now you know what they meant. Um, instead of, well, is the time, uh, does it go on this activity to mean the whole course or does it go over here? There's a way to say, this is where you put the time. Right. This is where you put the pass or the fail. So right. um, it, it tells you uh, what to do. Um, and, and yes, the, the structure, it tells you how to create a package so you can actually have a, a set of, of more traditional learning experiences tied together that you can hand off to someone else and they can launch it. Right. Yeah. And I, from, my, from, from where I sit and, and the conversations that I have with people most days, um, I get most excited about CMI5 because of the, the, the expectation that I have is that as CMI5 starts to take root and wider and wider adoption becomes uh, you know, a reality, more and more LMSs will begin to support it, which still for most organizations is kind of the, the, the hub of their learning environment. Um, and a lot of things can ultimately branch off from the LMS. Once you start being able to take advantage of the experience API specification inside of a learning management system, which is a lot of what CMI5 is, is kind of helping us with, um, organizations start to see the value of, of, of data within their the learning part of their business. And perhaps that starts to get them excited about what other applications could they start to adopt to track other activities and util, utilizing XAPI within those types of systems. So it's it's a great kind of leaping off point, I think, for a lot of organizations. So it's, you know, as you're thinking about LMSs and uh, looking at LMS adoption, uh, you know, be asking about CMI5 for sure. Uh, real quickly, we've said this a few times. Uh, this is always one of the things that we like to have in a, in a, in a presentation. Um, it's kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, I'm sure all of you understand this, but just to sort of put a pin in it, um, occasionally you've heard, heard Ben and I say tin can, uh, mostly talking about sort of the older work that was done around it. Um, but we like to just state clearly, they're exactly the same thing. Uh, you will really not hear Rustacy Software talk about Tin Can unless we're talking about that early kind of packaging specification, right? Because that is still technically we would refer to that as a Tin Can package. Yes. So that I think you were trying to get me to go there on a previous slide. So yeah, no, right. I wasn't picking up on it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but um, yeah, this was something that um, as uh, as well, we were calling it tin can there, as we were coming up with what that should look like, we realized that there really ought to be a way to launch it because there were all these, um, you know, all these other use cases that we wanted to be able to support, being able to track statements and simulations or so on, but people still wanted to be able to launch. But, but actually that wasn't where the community that was active in developing what was called tin can at the time, that, that wasn't where they were thinking. Mm -hmm. So I took... I mean, I, I remembered as maybe an afternoon, but maybe it was a day or two, but it was a very small amount of time to write up a document detailing how I thought you could actually put together uh, a package that, mm -hmm. that would use this, uh, that would use Tin Can and how you could launch it. And then I kind of, I, I shared that out with the, the community at the time. I was hoping that we'd get some feedback about how can we, you know, how can we make this better? What should we do with this? And really right. no one was interested in working on it. Yeah. But as, as Tin Can was released, people still, they did actually want to launch things. And we said, okay, here, you can use this thing. Yeah. So it, it, it's amazes, it's amazing to me how well this has actually worked in practice versus the amount of time that, that went right. into developing it in the first place. Um, but um, that is, uh, that is the only commonly used launch mechanism for for X API that I'm aware of, and I think if there were commonly used ones, I'd probably be aware. Um, right. Besides that, um, yeah. so when people are talking about launching just plain X API, it's really this thing. You know, you go in and the package that has this tin can XML in there. That's why it's this yep. old launch de facto standard. Yeah, which we are we are 
we are trying uh, uh, we're trying hard, I think, as a as a larger community that's evangelizing these things uh, to encourage people to move away from tin can to CMI five. That is the the ultimate yes. direction that the community is heading in. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll see lots of lots of applications beginning to support CMI five uh, into the future. Um, OK, so I'm, I just keep checking my watch. We've got about 10 minutes left on the presentation. So there's a couple of things that we just wanted to kind of uh, probably quickly go through here towards the end, although these could be even larger conversations. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, you know, if there is any interest in folks on the call uh, in in having a longer conversation, uh, you know, you can come come to rustacsoftware.com, uh, reach out to us, uh, and you're likely going to talk to me about these things. And I'm happy to talk to you as long as you'd like about uh, about all the things that we're talking about today. A couple of things that we like to touch on on presentations like this are around uh, kind of the procurement side of uh, XAPI enabled or CMI five enabled applications. Um, really, what we're striving to 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 hopefully help with uh, here is around kind of the moments where adding tin can tool or uh, old habits die hard uh, <laughs> XAPI tools to your uh, to your kind of broader learning and development environment. Um, and what we found over the years is that uh, you know there's a there's a few different moments where it it tends to make sense to really kind of lean in um, and make some purchasing decisions around uh, uh, XAPI enabled tools. Um, there are some moments where you're using an existing product um, and perhaps they, for whatever reason, didn't include their kind of native XAPI support in the original, you know, license that you had of that product. But with a product renewal, that might be an opportunity to start being able to leverage some of that support. Um, you see some products in, in the industry that sort of gatekeep some of their functionality. And, and to, in, in some cases, XAPI is like an add-on uh, kind of capability of a product. So uh, moments where you're looking at product renewals might be a good opportunity to have the conversation with the product provider uh, in uh, understanding, do they support it already? And if so, uh, what does it take to sort of take advantage of that with, with that particular product? Um, contract conclusions with, with, with systems that you're not going to move forward with is also an interesting opportunity to start going back to the market and looking at replacements perhaps for a legacy system that you're not going to you know renew a contract with um and looking at uh technology that that has xapi support and getting advantage of that um through just procuring new technology uh in an effort to perhaps replace uh a legacy system changing from one lms to another tends to be a moment where a lot of people start making considerations around does the next lms that we procure um, need to uh, support, you know, CMI5 ideally um, with maybe some XAPI capabilities as well. Um, getting into more sort of advanced learning activities, um, you know, a lot of people get excited about XAPI in the in the more non traditional activity spaces, simulations, AR and VR games, and and those types of things. Um, so you know, looking for providers that are uh, getting you what you need with respect to those activities, but a bonus would be, do they have an XAPI implementation? Um, there's some interesting work being done around the industry in building, uh, you know, Unity profiles for XAPI. I know I've talked to a few VR companies about that over the past couple of years. Um, and then, you know, leaning into sort of outcomes, like, you know, Ben mentioned earlier, um, the idea of sort of correlating learning activities to some outcome that the business might care about. Um, and as soon as you start having those types of conversations among your team, uh, you are venturing into an XAPI world, perhaps. Um, and, and, you know, important to start thinking about some technology acquisitions that could help you get there. Um, you know, as far as uh, platform considerations and being mindful of time, um, this is even a, perhaps a longer conversation to have, um, but you, you can you can read this list here. These are some of the ideas that uh, we talk to uh, folks about um, when purchasing a system that uh, supports the Experience API and some of the things that you need to be aware of. Kind of the, the big one in my mind is the, the, the purchasing of a learning management system uh, that you know, says that it supports XAPI. Um, perhaps it says it supports CMI5. 
Um, one of the things that we always, or I personally always encourage people to uh, to talk about with those types of providers is how can I get the data out? Um, and can I do that in a non-proprietary way? Um, what you end up, what we end up tend to finding is that when organizations start to venture down the XAPI path, um, the mindset of what lives at the center of your ecosystem starts to change a bit. Um, and, and the LMS kind of starts to drift uh, as a data source to a centralized learning analytics tool, something like, again, a watershed or a learning locker or something like that. So the ability for you to bring data from an application like an LMS via the Experience API into a centralized LRS um, starts to become something that organizations are, are quite interested in doing. Um, and not all LMSs have been seen to be kind of equal there. Um, they they don't maybe easily provide a way to get data out of their own internal LRS into kind of a standalone LRS. So there's some other considerations here um, that we're showing on the slide as well uh, that are worth worth thinking about as you're looking at you know procurement of of technology. Um, okay, so Ben, let's talk about testing real quick. And then hopefully maybe we still have a little bit of time for for questions. Um, uh, what are your comments? Just kind of maybe briefly on the testing side of things. I know we've got a couple of slides on testing. Yeah, I'll try to rip through this quickly. I mean, it. I want to say testing is important. Um, you there are tools uh, to test. Well, for for CMI five, there's tools to test the uh, the content. For XAPI, you can test the LRS. There isn't really anything to uh, to test the, the content. Um, in terms of getting data back out, it's interesting to note, I think important to note that the an LRS, the LRS test suite verifies you can get the data out. So if you've got an LRS that conforms, it is technically possible to get the data out, even if the organization doesn't make it easier to hand out credentials, it's technically yeah. possible. Um, so I think that's important to know. Um, and of course, uh, SCORM Cloud is there and you can try out your, uh, your content there as well. Um, just with, with time running out, just yes, testing is important. You should do it. You should make sure your vendors have done it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things on the XAPI side of things, ADL has a great uh, resource there around LRSs that have passed the test suite. Uh, and so yes. if you're wondering about uh, an LRS provider, um, if they've passed it, uh, go to adlnet.gov. Uh, uh, do a search for that, and you'll see the list of all of the the LRSs that have passed that te that test suite. Um, okay, so I'm looking at my clock. We've got about three minutes until <laughs> the bottom of the hour, Ben. So uh, let's see. We're looking back. I'm looking back in a in a separate document that some of our friends have been uh, putting some questions together. Uh, and with uh, with the amount of time that we have left, let me see. Are there any draft XAPI profiles for VR? Uh, that can be shared. Does support for CMI5 include support for the XAPI scheme? Um, so I have had some conversations with some organizations who are working on, um, uh, I believe, the Unreal Engine uh, and some XAPI things around that. Um, Come to me, reach out to Rusticy Software, go to rusticysoftware.com, fill out the contact form, uh, Brian, and uh, we can we can go back and forth via email on that. Um, I might check with them to make sure that they're okay with me, you know, sharing what they're working on, that type of thing. But there is some activity around um, around some of the the Unity and, and Unreal Engine stuff in the in the VR space. Um, this other question: Does support for CMI five include support for the XAPI standard? So Yes. Go ahead, Ben. Hit yeah. that one again. Um, you know, I, I I don't know for sure if the the test suite available for CMI five actually checks that, but to conform to CMI five, it is in the CMI five spec that you must have a XAPI conformant LRS. So, um, if you are co conforming according to the spec, then it does uh, imply LRS conformance as well. Right. Right. Uh, let's see. I was going back into chat real quick to see if there were other uh, very new nah, other resources sites you'd recommend. Uh, yeah, so Taylor um, xapi.com is a great deep website these days. In the early days when we first launched it in 2020 in 2012, uh, it was a you know not as deep as as it is today. But we've been curating content on that space for 
uh, a very long time. There's a whole section of xapi.com that is dedicated to CMI5 uh, and a research project that we worked on last year called Catapult, which has a bunch of profile or a bunch of prototypes and various things like that um, uh, that are that are available there. Again, uh, I'll just wrap things up because I know we're about to run out of time. Um, information on the screen here, uh, various websites, ways to get a hold of us. Um, our mantra is ask us anything really. And we, we really do mean that. There yeah. are very few places that you can go in the industry to actually talk to a human being about these types of interesting, uh, sometimes uh, challenging standards and specifications. So uh, please, if you have questions, come to us uh, and we're happy to, to answer those. And, and you know, perhaps, you know, I'll put my sales hat on occasionally and talk about a product that we might be able to help you with as well. But super grateful for everyone taking the time. Ben, thanks for, uh, for joining today as well and providing those insights. And uh, yeah, we're excited to hopefully get to talk to folks in the future as things come up. Thank you, Andy. And thanks everyone.